Welcome back to the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. My next guest is a gentleman named Thomas Fu. Now, Thomas is the reason why, actually, this podcast is late, because um, I'm recording this intro um, from a little hotel room in a town called Susian in Tibet, where I'm on a trip with Thomas and his fellow explorers. Now, Thomas is an in- intriguing character because although he graduated from Imperial College in London, one of the world's top universities way back when, and he could have had a really lucrative career in the corporate world, he chose to not take that path. And his for the last 30, 40 years, he has carved a name for himself, uh, organizing races in the four-wheel drive world, in the rally world. He has started Explorer Outfitter shops where he sells all kinds of exploring exploration gear uh, all over the Klang Valley. Explorer Outfitter and Publica is his, for example. But I think where he really carved his name is in the travel space where he's been taking explorers and guests all around the world and to some really, really uh, adventurous places where people don't really want to go or don't really have the guts of courage to go. And he, he takes people there by four-wheel drive and by motorcycle. Uh, Trans-Siberia, Trans-Africa, Europe to Asia, Asia back to Europe, all across South America, all across North America, both the poles, North and South. And I think his story is really interesting. So as always, if you do find some learnings or some inspiration from this interview I've done with Thomas, please do share it, tell, tell your friends about it, like this video if you can. And also, as always, do subscribe to the channel because it will do a great help if you can. And so, now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, may I present Thomas Fu. Thomas Fu. Yes, how are you, Morning? I think this one is about 10 years in the making. Because <laughs> I've, I've, before I came to track you down in Publica, where your shop is, right, um, I'd seen pictures of your convoy and your trips in various people's Facebook postings. And I was like, holy shit, what is this? Go- what is going on here? This is a fantastic expedition. You know, I, I saw these pictures of these land cruisers completely kitted out, you know, bombing through the African plains, you know, huge tyres, the roof rack full of gear. And I was like, what's going on here? How, how do I get on this trip? Who is doing this, right? Then suddenly, I, you know, finally one day I came across you and I found that you were the organiser of this trip. Came to see you in Publica. That trip didn't happen. That was about 10 years ago. And finally, here we are, right? Um, and, you know, so, so this is interesting because you've been doing these huge expeditions all over the world. Africa, Central Asia, South America, Trans-Europe, Trans-Africa, all over the world. Uh, maybe 30 years already, about 40 trips in total, right? Something like that. Maybe you tell me more about it later. But, um, and you've never done any marketing. You've never done any, any advertising. You've never done any promotion. Uh, this might even be the first interview on you ever, 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 right? How did it all start for you? Actually, it started when I was a kid. Uh, in school, primary school, you see, you listen to uh, Sir G- Captain James Cook, uh, Sir Francis Drake, uh, Ferdinand Magellan, and then uh, uh, circumnavigating the earth, the world, uh, Cape of Good Hope, uh, Cape York, and then discovering uh, Malaysia, Francis Lake. Uh, that fired my imagination. Uh. So, uh, since I was a kid, uh, first thing, of course, you, you do is a bicycle. And uh, at an early age of eight years old, I, I actually rode a bicycle to uh, Port Dickson. <laughs> eight years old? Yeah. <laughs> and then at 10 years old, I uh, to satisfy my, 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 my urge for uh, to see places, uh, uh, hitchhiked to Panko Island myself. And then uh, when uh, I was like uh, 13 years old, uh, I used to... Uh, secretly buy a motorcycle, a cup chai, and then uh, it began going to further places, la. going to Malacca, uh, riding the cup chai to even uh, uh, Joe Baru, which takes uh, three days. And then uh, as you go up, you know, uh, the more places you see, uh, the imagination and the passion for exploration uh, to see the world uh, became greater and greater. La. So then, uh, when you started working, when you can afford uh, to buy a car, then you started going further places. Uh, so then, uh, after doing it for so many years, even while I was a student, 
Uh, I used to study in England. Uh, I used to get three jobs. Daytime, morning uh, as a cleaner, office cleaner. Uh, then go to lectures, go to university. Nighttime, go and uh, be a bartender. Just to save up enough money to fuel my little passion. Uh, to be able to travel Europe on my motorcycle, on the car. And then... Uh, Places just got further and further. La. <laughs> From England, at first you visit uh, Scotland, then you, you visit France, and then you visit uh, Western Europe, then Eastern Europe, then North Africa, and then you just got further and further. La. And then when I got back to Malaysia about uh, 30 years ago, uh, then I started la, with, uh, exploring Asia. And then since then, uh, we have done uh, 40 trips around the world. And I think the rest, the rest is history. La. <laughs> So you've been doing this your entire life. You yes. came back, you, you never got a <coughs> 9 to 5 job, work in some bank. You just you just decided to make traveling and exploring your, your job, is it? Uh, no, I when I came back, uh, my, my father was the one who said, hey, it's time to go come back, you know, stop stop doing your nonsense things. You know. <laughs> to him, uh, you know, traveling here, going here, riding a motorcycle here and going there was nonsense, you know. He says, you come back and then uh, traditionally you, you try and... Uh, Get yourself uh, married and then <laughs> settle down. <laughs> Usually buy a house and, you know, have kids and that wasn't for me. La. Okay, fine, I'm married, but, uh, you know, but uh, the urge of uh, traveling, exploring never died. La. So it has just gone on for the past uh, whole life. La. So 40 trips already, right? Yes. Um, talk, talk about some, so, so what were some of the outstanding ones? Uh, we have... Uh, tried to go to every continent on Earth, uh, ranging from North America, South America. North America, I've done a lot of motorcycles because I used to work in uh, Boeing in Seattle. And that time, after uni, after uni, I, I traveled whole of North America. Then, uh, South America, we have gone to every country there is, uh, from uh, Guyana to Suriname to... Uh, French Guiana to Venezuela, Colombia, Chile, Peru, uh, Brazil, Argentina, uh, on uh, over seven times. Uh. Uh, each time, let's say, for example, was from Buenos Aires to, for example, uh, to San Diego. We would take the Brazilian route uh, into uh, Peru, uh, Chile, and then, and then uh, coming back over to uh, Africa, we have done uh, Cape Town to Cairo, uh, the fable Sir David Livingston uh, discovery route uh, two times. And we have done uh, Southern Africa, uh, Central Africa uh, four or five times, uh, each time on a safari, a cultural angle. And then uh, in Asia, we have uh, done to Magadan, the end, end of the Asian continent. Uh, both from uh, Malaysia to Magadan near the Red, uh, Yellow Sea on top of Adivostok and then uh, we have uh, gone to Scandinavia to North Cape right to the northernmost point of Europe and then uh, uh, for example uh, we have just completed our seventh uh, Paris to Colombo Seventh. Seven times. <laughs> Seven <laughs> times Paris to KL. Uh, well, the first three times was London to Kuala Lumpur. Okay. And then, uh, well, we have been to London, England so many times. Uh, honestly, I didn't find any more interesting. Uh. So forget about the uh, English Channel. Uh. Okay, let's start from Paris. Uh. Paris was very symbolic because it was Putrajaya to Paris, you know. Paris to Putrajaya. Yeah. You know. And then, uh, we have... Uh, uh, crisscross all over the place. Uh. So, uh, and we've just come back from uh, the last one, Paris to Kuala Lumpur, uh, just last month. Uh, we had intended to drive all the way back from India into Myanmar and Thailand back here, but unfortunately, there was some political disturbance uh, in Myanmar, so we couldn't. So our, our latest trip was, we ended up in Calcutta and shipped back uh, the cars and the motorcycles. So besides this, uh, we have uh, driven from Kuala Lumpur to across the Himalayas uh, into Nepal in India. 
uh, we have gone and uh, the entire length of the entire Andes, the entire Andes starts from the Sierra Madeira Mountains uh, in Colombia and it stretches for about uh, four or five thousand kilometers right down to Ushuaia, the southernmost uh, city on Earth, uh, 55 degrees south. And we've done that. And then uh, uh, we have uh, gone to uh, the full length of the Himalayas, starting from uh, Yunnan right up to Western Tibet, uh, where it meets the Karakoram, and uh, also driven down the Macha Pass, the pass that divides the Himalayas and the Karakoram, the middle pass that leads you into Xinjiang. Uh. And then uh, on uh, Central Asia, we have uh, yeah we have we have gone exploring into uh, all the Central Asian states lah. Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and uh, gone across the uh, Kazakhstan deserts, and then down south, uh, Australia, we did a loop. Uh, on the Australian continent, starting from Brisbane, by the southern coast up to uh, Adelaide into Perth, and then cut across the Canning Stock Route. That's from, a tough one. Uh, yeah, Canning Stock Route starts from the Viluna uh, to Halls Creek. It's a one thousand eight hundred kilometers of off road, the longest off road in the world. Uh, and uh, finished in Northern Territory, cut down the Stuart Highway down to. Astro Uluru and cut across the big red Simpson Desert back to Brisbane. So uh, our trips is uh, more about passion. Uh. It's about uh, exploring the off the beaten track, uh, so to speak. Uh, not the regular tourist traps. Uh, tourist traps we will go in as a support logistical hub. Uh, like for example, you have to fly in somewhere. So those uh, tourist traps you will use as uh, in-out places. Like. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, the entire life is about going on a journey. Like. More about destination. Like, like for example, uh, the coming trip is to Tibet. And uh, yeah, we will sure go and visit the Potala Palace. But uh, that is not the most important thing. Like. The most important thing is the drive from Malaysia to Tibet overland. You see the full range of uh, culture, uh, scenery, food, uh, religious content, uh, passion, and uh, buildings and uh, history and the whole works. When you fly into a place to see, you are visiting a tourist trap. Whereas we go overland, at the end of the day, uh, it's a big horizon. That's why we say it's a broadening horizon. And then when you are in the deserts of Australia, when you are in the deserts of Gobi, when you cross the Atacama, because of the view of the terrain and scenery, eh, it has got a magical effect. You know? It opens up your heart. You feel peace. And then when you open up your heart, you become peaceful, you become happy, and you will learn to treat nature and people uh, nicely. La. So we say purifies your soul. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, so far, uh, 40 trips. La. Yeah, um, of course. The other gentleman I wanted to raise as well was Yusuf Hashim. Yes. He, he, I think he was the second or third guy in my podcast about three years ago. And, you know, he, he planned his life out beautifully. Lah. He worked for, I think, 30 years. Retired, tepat, tepat, 53 years old. Job done. All his kids were all grown up. University, all working already. You know, um, house paid for. Bit of money, the bank. Then he said, okay, lah, time out on working. <laughs> Let's go and see the world because everybody has, you know, life is about seasons, right? There's a season for everything. And for him, he's been doing this for the last literally 25 years. He's been, he's been like you. He's done everything. He's done all the bucket list over and over again. Yes. Antarctica, North Pole, North America, South America, Africa, Asia, etc., etc. And he, he says the same thing because travel really expands the mind. It makes you more tolerant of other cultures, more tolerant of other peoples. You see the world as it is. You realize how lucky we are, right? And it really expands the horizon. 
Um, I want to talk about the gear though, um, you know, because I'm a bit of a gear nut, right? And when I came to see you 10 years ago, I had a Land Cruiser, right? And of all the vehicles you've, you've used, you've, you've, you swear by the Toyota Land Cruiser, right? Yes. Um, so talk to me about your gear. What's your, what's your gear uh, frame of mind? Oh, uh, when you are on an exploration trip, obviously you would want uh, uh, a machine that is uh, most reliable. And uh, most reliable meaning it must, besides being most reliable, a problem saga is most reliable, no issue. But uh, you also need the load bearing capability. You need the size uh, to combat against the uh, elements, uh, sandstorm, wind, and then uh, you need the stability. You need to be able to uh, have a vehicle that is like a, as big as an elephant, but uh, uh, can uh, go like a springbok, you know, and also with the eyes of a leopard. So you need uh, equipment, a vehicle that has got uh, a big capability, a big engine, a uh, rough engine, a uh, coarse engine can take anything you throw into it, any quality of diesel. And then you need a size, you need a size as big as an elephant, and you need the vehicle to be as nippy as a, as a, as a, as a deer. And you need the, the lights uh, strong like a leopard's eyes. And uh, not many vehicles fit into that build. What about Land Rovers? <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, you have a very um, strong opinion on Land Rovers, right? Land Rovers are very, very good vehicles. But uh, in terms of... Uh, Overall reliability, uh, the Land Rovers lose out to the Land Cruisers. Uh, for some reason, the Land Rovers are more sensitive to temperature, to heat, to uh, water. And then also, the Land Rover lacks the size. In terms of width, length, height, uh, it's a smaller vehicle. It's about, I would say, 10-15% smaller than a Land Cruiser. Not talk about the Defender, you know, what about the, you know, the, not, not talking about the um, original, you know, the 110, right? But the Defenders, not the Defenders, the um, Discoveries and the Range Rovers. What about those? Because the, this, the Range Rover is, is a bit like the uh, 300 series uh, Toyota Land Cruiser or even the 200 series, right? Kind of like the same, same, same kind of size, right? Yes. Oh, uh, for... For whatever reason, uh, uh, generally, uh, the perception of uh, Range Rovers, Land Rovers, uh, uh, loses out slightly to the reliability of the Land Cruisers. And then uh, also another important issue is uh, uh, currently, uh, Toyota seem to have uh, covered the world pretty well. Uh. In almost every country you go, uh, you will find uh, Toyota support, lah. Huh? Toyota support, mm. or even like the ex owners and the second-hand parts market is quite yeah. vibrant, right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas for uh, Land Rovers, uh, first of all, a lot of countries used to own Land Rovers, but somehow or other, the older version Land Rovers uh, have not been able to provide the support needed for defenders. And the current generation of Land Rovers are, are all super high-tech. And uh, when yeah. you talk about the uh, uh, electronic control units, circuit boxes, uh, then, then, then you, you get a bit worried. Because yeah, yeah, because I think a lot of people don't realise that um, although you might be buying computers on wheels, right, um, overall reliability is, especially if you want to do a huge overland trip, you know, 30,000, 40,000 kilometres, right, if something breaks down in the middle of the, the Karakoram, for example, you're sunk, you've got no support. Mm -hmm. And you can't fix it on the road, whereas I think with a Land Cruiser, you can. But not every Land Cruiser, right? Because I think the 70 series, the 80 series, you know, the famous Ninja Turtle, that one is very, very good. All the way from to the 100 series to the 200 series is pretty good. Then I think maybe beyond that, it's a bit too high-tech already, right? Yes. Huh? Definitely. Yeah. Even uh, Simplicity is the key here, I think. Correct, correct, correct. You you hit the nail on the head. Huh. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah, the 80 series is a legend because it can be repaired under the tree. Under the tree. 
the hundred series uh, can be can be repaired uh, quite easily, provided uh, you already pre amp uh, what can possibly go wrong. So you bring the parts with you, lah. Yeah, basically the most important is some computer chips, uh, ECU, a circuit board, and then uh, some basic parts, uh, which you don't have to carry a lot of parts. Uh. There are certain parts that you need to bring, and once you have those, are uh, you okay? Uh, the hundred series for Land Cruiser is still very very repair friendly. Uh, almost uh, most countries in the world uh, have the Land Cruisers hundred series. Even you go to distant places like uh, Turkmenistan, you go to for example in uh, Congo, uh, you go to for example Colombia, uh, Brazil. Uh, you know, there are lots and lots of 100 series. Uh. And uh, also, uh, generally, it's, uh, even if you don't find any particular part of the 100 series in any place you are, it also is not a hassle uh, to have it air flown in from Kuala Lumpur or from, from uh, Japan or whatever. Like. And uh, I have got no issues with Land Rover or Range Rovers, but... It's just that the the global support la, I would say la, uh, loses out to the Toyotas. So the reliability is legendary la. Um, yeah. A couple of instances, I think I rem- remember the episode with J- uh, Jeremy Clarkson in Top Gear. Yeah. He tried to kill the Toyota Hilux. <laughs> <laughs> he drove it into the into the wash. He, he he smashed the car. He set the thing of, on fire. They dropped it from the top of a building. Cannot die. Still can start. <laughs> he drove it into the bloody studio. Can you imagine, right? Yeah. And then, you know, there's those pictures of those, um, you know, um, the, the terrorists in Africa. They're all on Toyota Hiluxes. Yeah. It's incredible, yeah. right? I think Toyota reliability is... I hope they if there's one thing they don't forsake in this new crop of hybrid cars and EVs and all that, they don't become less reliable because that's why people buy Toyotas. Yeah. Right? Well, uh, it's the same. Uh, even up to now, you still get the uh, 40 series running on the road. Uh, yeah, the, F, the famous BJs yeah, and FJs, yeah. right? And yeah. then the 70 series, the 180 yeah. series still running on the road. And... Uh, I don't think that those cars are going to die in the next 20 or 30 years. La. They will still be around. I mean, the 40 series was made in what, in, the, in the 60s. 60s that, yeah. In the 60s, that it was uh, what, 60 years ago. Yeah. And they're still running around yeah. beautifully. Yeah. And uh, if all goes haywire, you can easily put a, a 80 series engine into a 40 series and you still go. Yeah. It's just that the chassis, the body frames, and then the way it's designed, and then uh, simplicity is a key. La. Yeah. Your trips are actually quite legendary for the distance. So, like, your trips are at least a month long, maybe a month and a half, right? Yes. You're going through 10, 20 countries. You know, you're going through, you're experiencing every weather pattern from winter to, to desert to tropical to sub Saharan, right? Um, sandstorms you know, extreme cold. I think some of the passes you've been through over 6,000 meters, right, in India. Was it the Kila Pass or... Yeah, Mila Kadunga, Pass in... Mila Pass, Mali, right? Mila Pass in uh, China and Kadunga in... Uh, Kadungla, right, in, yeah, in, in India. India, right? Yeah. And then uh, also uh, the Kyrgyzstan uh, Pamir Pass. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, all above 5,000, 6,000 meters. So sandstorms come through. Is, is the cabin sandstorm proof, tight? Uh, you know, so so. What element of danger is there? Is there any element of danger when you your your trips? Uh, yeah, they must. The most dangerous thing about our trips was uh, to be to get into a political uh, uh, yeah. situation. S- yeah. Uh, many years ago, we were driving across from uh, China to India via Nepal. And uh, in that time, at that time, there was the what they call the civil revolution. Uh, it was, uh, you know, a certain uh, ethnic group of people was trying to uh, get rid of the monarchy. And uh, we were stopped uh, in one of the mountains. And uh, they needed, uh, all they wanted was uh, publicity. And uh, they wanted our vehicles. Holy shit. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. So actually, we negotiated lah. Uh, to them, it was wow, ten units of beautifully modified uh, Land Cruisers is exactly what they needed. Yeah. You know? <laughs> In the mountains, <laughs> this is perfect. You know. So machine guns, everything lah. Uh, well, they were not that well armed, but uh, to us, you know. Anybody stopping us on the road in the mountains, uh, it was is is a bit cause for concern, lah. Uh, yes. And yeah, because that's the thing, right? Some yeah. of these passes that you're going through, it's quite inhospitable terrain. Yes. Some of it could be hostile. Definitely very dead, uh, sparsely populated, right? Definitely. So anybody with a bit of weaponry or whatever, they, and some of your guests are quite, I would say, wealthy, lah, right? Mm. Because they have to pay top dollar for this kind of experience, right? Mm. So uh, that time we negotiated. And then in the end, we settled with the financial, uh, you know. Just sorted them out, lah. Yeah, sorted them out, lah. So negotiated for one and a half days, oh and finally, <laughs> finally they let us off, lah. That could have been a bit hairy for the guests, right? Yeah, yeah. So when people sign up for your trip, they have to buy into the basically the unknown. There's that. It's it's there's a lot of unknowns, right? I mean, there could be a million and one things that go wrong, right? Burst tires, sandstorms, you know, uh, animals, whatever, right? We generally we are not uh, we are quite well prepared uh, for any of these uh, mechanical uh, problems uh, but if there is a political uh, situation uh, we will avoid it. Like for example, uh, the current uh, instability in Myanmar uh, would have to be avoided totally because. Uh, uh, when it comes to a human uh, human element, a uh, political uh, problem, uh, that is hard to resolve. Uh. And uh, any other mechanical or any uh, uh, problem we face among our group uh, can be solved, is not an issue. If anything can be solved with money, it's not a problem, it's only a cost. So you bring, you bring uh, adequate cash with you also? Uh, all sorts. Uh, all all, all currencies. Huh? Yeah. But What's the best one is the US dollar, obviously, right? We don't carry a lot of cash mm. because uh, in this modern days, uh, we try to use uh, through the banks. And, uh, you know, some one way or the other, like, you'll be able to manage. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Then definitely food, you just pack it in. Like. Uh, recently, over the last uh, three, four years, like, everywhere we go, we bring our own chef. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fantastic, man. His name is uh, K-Rock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, His name is Kellogg as in Conflicts. Oh, K- K-Rock. K-Rock, oh, okay, okay, okay. Short form of Kenny Rogers. He was the executive chef of Kenny Rogers. <laughs> okay, no I'm, not, I'm not marketing him, but, <laughs> but he's our chef. And uh, we go for long trips, uh, two-month trips, you know. And uh, in the middle of the desert, we have an Nassalama. Oh, fantastic, we have kambing, man. You know, we will have daging uh, ayam merah. You know, Fantastic. we have uh, fried rice and then we have sambal. So, uh, in any long trip, uh, the first two weeks is okay. Okay, fine. You have salmon, you have got uh, uh, spaghetti, but after two weeks, uh, huh, salmon again. Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you begin to miss it. You know? yeah, yeah, Malaysians yeah. are a spoiled lot uh, as far as food is concerned. Yeah. Malaysians are very resilient, very tough, uh, very team playing, and very obedient. And uh, full of adventure, but food, we are really spoiled. They will only complain about food. They will not complain about hotels. They will not complain about the long distances. They will not complain about over adventure. Over adventure means, you know, tough adventures. They will not complain against cold, hot, wet. No problem at all. But food, yes, they will complain. You know, honestly, uh, I've been to so many countries. Uh, I've been to maybe. I don't know, lah, maybe 40 countries. Not as many as you, okay? Okay, not as many as you. I think at last count, there's maybe 250 countries in the world. So I've maybe been to about a seventh of them. Lah. But, you know, very few countries uh, have the variety of food we have, you know. In one small city in KL, right, you've got Indian, you've got Chinese, you've got Malay, you've got Turkish, you've got Yemen, you've got uh, Japanese, you've got Italian, everything under the sun. We really, and actually not that expensive, honestly, not that expensive on a relative basis. You go to Hong Kong, you pay through your nose, you finish, die, you Singapore, forget it, right? Yeah. We really uh, have, are so lucky, you know. Downstairs, the Nasi Lemak, six bucks, amazing. Okay, six bucks is not cheap for Nasi Lemak, lah, but it was bloody good, man, you know? Yeah. But I I have to I have to uh, attest that Malaysia is the 
biggest food haven in the world. It is, right? Not, not, not only in ASEAN. We, okay, you know, we have been to quite a lot of countries. And uh, even... Would you say you've been to every country in the world? Oh, uh, I wouldn't say that, but uh, almost there, la, <laughs> <laughs> if it's reachable by land, la, we probably have been, except on the little islands la, ah, of yeah, the Caribbean yeah. and uh, of the South Pacific, and uh, little islands that are not accessible by, 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 by land, uh, probably we give it a miss. Uh, but, uh, yeah, most countries are uh, accessible by land. And I would attest uh, that uh, I have not found one single place on Earth, uh, planet Earth, uh, that can match our food here. Uh. Not even in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, they say that, okay, you have got a melting pot of East and Mass, uh, no match. No, no. They lose out. Not. Crazy. In in Malaysia is the uh, is the uh, you know nowhere in the world uh, you can say that you know okay the best food is in Turkey you know in uh, Iran and in Hong Kong in uh, in uh, in uh, Paris you get everything in New York everything no no not Kuala Lumpur absolutely man Penang absolutely absolutely thank you Penang <laughs> Penang <laughs> Johor Bahru oh. fantastic fantastic yeah hey, I want to ask you right so. You know, you you have your own fleet of vehicles, uh, huh? Yes. So, like, when you plan, so do you ship them to that place? How, how do you move them around? Because they, they're like your convoy, right? Yes. Actually, I've seen the photos. Uh, it's bloody impressive, right? Ten land cruisers to support vehicles. Or oh, then the plume of sand coming from behind when you're crossing the African desert. It's like, it's like really the, a schoolboy's dream, you know, like, to see the world this way. It's an adventurous tale, you know. Actually, not many people can do this, law, you know. And in fact, it's not for everybody also, lah. You know, um, how how do you move your vehicles around? Uh, uh in this world, uh, there are two types of uh, uh, vehicle movements. Uh. One is uh, what they call uh, temporary importation permits, which is uh, acceptable in most countries. When you do that, uh, generally the owner of the vehicle have to be with the vehicle when the vehicle is brought into the country. The other way is uh, you use a system of uh, what we call an international vehicle passport called a FIA Carnet de Passage. Mm, they're, kind of, they're really expensive though, right? A Carnet de Passage, uh, Duane. But uh, it's only for those countries uh, that are subscribing to the FIA system. Uh. So like for example, uh, uh, even if you drive from London to Kuala Lumpur, you pass by 18 countries. Uh. All these 18 countries are uh, the only countries that need a, a carnet de passage uh, under the French system uh, are countries like Iran, Pakistan, India, Myanmar, uh, and uh, Thailand, yes and no. That's it. Uh. Whereas the entire uh, Europe and the entire uh, rest of the world uh, don't need a carnet. But you need to uh, have it stamped on your passport. And... Uh, to have your own fleet of vehicles is very important. You need to have uh, a lead, that's me, and then you need to have a mid uh, control middle convoy, a sweep at the back, and then you need to have a F&B truck, you need to have a mechanical truck. So uh, generally, la, in any convoy, la, we have been able to do it la, because we own our own fleet of vehicles. And... Uh, and uh, we are always uh, inviting people to join us as a crew uh, for certain, certain trips. Uh. And uh, so when you have a crew, you have a mechanic, you have a doctor, you have a, you have a sweeper, you have a navigator, you have a lead, you have a videographer, you have a blogger, and you have a camera pen, a person, you have a video guy. So uh, every trip, uh, you need a certain amount of crew, uh, up to maybe eight or nine people that... Uh, literally work in the trip line as well as seeing the world. So, uh, because we need to house these eight or nine people to have a successful trip, uh, we need our own vehicles. And every trip, uh, we will come up with uh, about uh, four to five trucks, Land Cruisers, that will carry the crew together with one or two uh, participants, explorers that do not have a vehicle but want to join the trip. Mm. So, uh, and then plus your additional 10, uh, 10 customer cars. Lah. So about 15 cars in total. Usually between 10 to 15. Lah. 
Never more than that. La. We don't want more than that. And the group size is always between 30 to 40 la, maximum. Because if, it, if the size group size goes beyond that, la, you have a problem with uh, refueling, with food, with rest stops, yeah, with hotels. Yeah, refueling, right? Because you come into a place, not enough petrol. That's it, you can't go on already. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Like, for example... Uh, uh, Do you carry spare petrol with you? Oh, yes. yes also, yes. right? For sure, for sure, right? Like, for example, uh, uh, when we did our Australian uh, trip, uh, every vehicle was carrying about uh, 120 litres of spare fuel. on Each, each vehicle? Each vehicle. Okay. Okay. This is on top of the uh, main tank and the sub-tank. So, in other words, uh, every vehicle was carrying approximately 300 litres of fuel. Because uh, the Canning Sock Road, uh, for 1,800 kilometres, eh, there's only one fuel stop in the I middle. I about that, yeah. 800 kilometres from uh, Viluna. And if you can't make it there, Koya. Koya. <laughs> the, the crude words, you're screwed. La. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, yeah. Because yeah. I've seen some videos yeah. on YouTube. They literally, actually, the, the people also, no food, no water, they actually literally die. Die, yeah. yeah. And then another thing is like, for example, when you uh, go to some, I would say, unsure countries, la, when you're crossing through, uh, example, la, uh, even uh, sometimes smaller towns la, in some godforsaken countries, uh, you are also not sure on the quality of the diesel. So therefore, to avoid having uh, uh, problems, uh, you carry extra fuel. Oh. And then uh, many people ask me, Thomas, why are we carrying so much fuel? Why do we have to carry 60 litres? Uh, there are petrol stations everywhere. It's right? a lifesaver, man. Yeah. yeah. Yes. There's a light petrol station everywhere. But you go to this small little town, uh, the petrol station is a hand pump, you know. So uh, it's not that we don't trust them, but but uh, we don't want to risk uh, putting in uh, well, contaminated grade, yeah. fuel. Yeah, yeah, lower grade, really lower yeah, grade. grade. Yeah. And uh, especially these days, uh, uh, sometimes uh, participants join us in their own uh, pickup trucks. Uh, like for example, the current generation of new Ford Rangers, the wild trucks, oh, those pretty the, good. the uh, Raptors, you know, the new Hiluxes, the new Pajeros, I mean the new uh, Mitsubishi uh, and the new Isuzu's. Uh, these vehicles are all common rail engines, you know. Common rail engines have got this big problem. They will perform a superb in the country with proper Euro 5 diesel. Perfect. But if you go to a country which is not Euro 5 yet, you put in a diesel maybe for us Euro 2. Generally, la, you will screw up the injectors. La. Oh, wow. Okay. And once these vehicles, uh, the new Vow trucks, Raptors, uh, the Hiluxes, uh, the Mitsubishis, you know, the Tritons, you know, the DMXs, uh, they all run on common rail engines, you know. And uh, if the fuel quality is not up to the mark, uh, what happens is uh, the vehicle would go into a default limb home mode, which means uh, it can go up to maybe 20, 30 kilometers an hour. Mm. But they can get you home eventually. La. Yeah. But you're in a convoy and we still have 200 kilometers to go and this car can, limp, can go at 30 kilometers an hour. How, how, how are you going to manage? Koya. Better don't do any, don't forget about driving, mm. stop the engine, tow it. Yeah. Yeah, just told the fella. Yeah. So, so when when but some participants want to bring their own car, right? What is the best vehicle to use? What uh, up until what generation? Say Hilux. It also depends on where you're going. Okay, let's say say it's hospitable la. Say you're crossing like like say for example, you know Australia, right? Two thousand kilometers uninterrupted. You don't know, right? So you know, you want the most hardy vehicle. What what up until what generation Hilux, for example? Uh, I would say up to the current uh, VNT series. La. Let's say, for example, uh, the Vigo. Uh, what year is that? Uh? 2017, is it? 2010. 2010. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. only up until then. Okay. Because uh, the new generation uh, pickup trucks, uh, uh, because of... Uh, Brand competition, mm. everybody goes on a common rail. Yeah. It's uh, more economical, it's uh, efficiency higher and everything. But it also needs a high quality fuel. Mm. And uh, so, uh, yeah, 
I would say to be 100% sure, not to say, but still go for a length cruiser. Yeah. And 80 series la, is uh, still the it's, the... it's the gold standard. La. Yeah, it's the standard. Yeah. La. How much are they going for nowadays, uh, the 80 series? They are quite uh, good value for money. Yeah. A very, very good 80 series. Uh, uh, basic spec, unmodified. You, you can't find one low mileage anymore. It's virtually impossible. It's okay to have a high mileage. High mileage means uh, you can you can buy 80 series, no problem for 400,000, half a million kilometers. All right. Holy moly, yeah. and still be all right. Yeah, you can have it overhaul. It's no issue. Mm. And uh, it will cost in the region of uh, between for 30, 40, 50,000. Mm. A fully done up uh, 80 series uh, in immaculate condition uh, will cost you about, will set you back about maybe 70 to 100,000. But that will take you to the ends of the earth. Uh. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and not die. <laughs> not die. <laughs> <laughs> So this one that you're going to, this Tibet trip, the one I'm actually uh, putting my hand up for, right? Um, Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, Everest Base Camp, right? Via Tibet. That's yes. interesting. Um, so that's... Okay, so why don't you tell me about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's the journey that's... Uh, yes. Uh, that's in October, we will be driving up to the Everest Base Camp uh, to the north side, north face of Everest, lah. And the journey takes you through uh, Thailand, Laos, and then into uh, Yunnan, China. And even in Yunnan, uh, we're not taking the super highway. We're taking the mountain roads, the small roads. And then uh, uh, we'll be going up to Tibet. And uh, to go to Tibet, everybody says, oh, you get AMS, uh, you get a headache, you know. The minute the, door, the plane door opens, you get a headache. But the only way not to get an AMS, uh, altitude mountain sickness, uh, it's actually to drive to Lhasa. Why? Because uh, Yunnan is only at uh, about uh, 500 to 800 meters. Then as you progress up Yunnan, you go up to 1,000, 2,000, 2,005. Then you hit slowly, you are ascending on the Tibetan Plateau, plateau from around uh, 2,000 to 4,000 meters altitude. Uh. But you're doing over a span of around a week or 10 days. Uh, and every day you're progressing altitude-wise, maybe about 500 meters so you're alright you will not get AMS guaranteed whereas if you fly into Lhasa instant AMS the minute you land in Lhasa at 3,600 3, meters the airplane doors open the headache starts pounding mm. and then big problem yeah otherwise the only other way is uh, uh, to take some uh, medicines uh, uh if you really have got AMS, uh, then uh, from our previous experience, you take Diamox. Mm. But uh, even though you know people laugh at me every time when I say it, uh, to me, after going to a few mountains here and there, I have to confess uh, that uh, personally, the medicine which I take to combat AMS uh, is Cialis. CLS, otherwise, the, or, or the counterpart to Viagra, right? Yes, that's right. And uh, that's interesting. So, so <laughs> I don't want you to be facetious here, but do you walk around around then? Uh, well, I, I think most of us know that CLS uh, only works uh, if you're aroused. Okay. Oh, so you, you have to have that input, lah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Otherwise, you, you you won't be like. No, no, you you will not get no. it. Okay. Uh, okay. You feel a bit of hoarseness, dryness in your throat. Okay. But the idea is to drink a lot of water. And uh, if you don't look at any uh, pictures or any videos or whatever, <laughs> or go into some funny sites, you know, uh, you don't get a problem. But you feel uh, that uh, you have absolutely no problem. You don't get any headaches. Yeah. Uh, you go in a mountain, you don't feel short of breath yeah. because uh, you slightly feel a higher rate, heartbeat rate. Yeah, That's yeah, all. yeah. But no AMS. Yeah, the idea is that um, these medicines or these tablets they improve circulation, right? Yes. So that's what they do. Because that's, right. that's what AMS because it constricts the blood vessels because of the altitude, right? Yes. Yeah. So so Yunnan, so you start about a, a five hundred meters, right? Then you go all the way up, and so Tibet is interesting because Tibet is a country that very few people go to, correct? Yes. Yeah. So what should we be looking out for there? Tibet, uh, along the way, uh, you would see a cross culture. Uh, this can, this area has got a magical effect. Right? Besides the big landscapes, that means the big mountains, 
the nice valleys and nice streams and nice uh, uh, glorious rivers, you also you still get the feeling of uh, culture. A Tibetan culture is very very different from Chinese culture. It is a, a, a culture that is brought down for you know a couple of thousand years, and uh, people are different, language are different, scenery is different, houses are different, and uh, terrain is different, and uh, also is compounded by the Buddhism effect. And the Buddhism effect uh, has got uh, is a tolerant religion, as you all know. So uh, you're talking about you go to Tibet, uh, you experience food, scenery, culture. Openness, uh, religion. It's basically a very beautiful place. Uh. You know, looking at the scenery alone, you don't have to pose for a picture uh, in Tibet. Uh. You use your handphone, you kind of uh, shoot anywhere in Tibet. Uh. It's postcard quality. You don't have to, okay, move left, right, right, okay, the mountain's there, okay, fine, okay, now this, okay, good shot. Don't have to. Tibet. <laughs> anywhere you shoot, uh, it's. Uh, Snow mountains and nice uh, uh, waterfalls, you know, uh, greenery and and quaint little houses against the clouds, against the blue sky. It's 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 just a beautiful place, uh, Tibet number one. And then, uh, combined by the fact uh, that you see little children, uh, uh, doing kind of like that, no, and then having little ponytails, uh, with red ribbons, you know, and then uh, you see a different culture, and then the food you drink, you drink uh, buttered milk, uh, butter uh, tea. And then uh, uh, food is different, and then and then you see the cows have got the hairy you know yaks you know, so and then uh, the mountains are different, the houses are different, food is different, people are different, language is different, and uh, quaint little villages perched on the mountain sides you know, it opens your heart. The highlight is Everest Base Camp. So Everest Base Camp, the one that everybody else knows is through uh, Nepal, right? You fly into Kathmandu. Then they take a small provincial tra- a plane to Lukla. And that Lukla landing is one of the reasons why I may not do it because it's so dangerous, right? Every year got at least one or two crashes, one. Okay, 50 people die or whatever, right? And then you, you track the track from Lukla all the way, blah, 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 you know, uh, Namchi Bazaar and all the way through to Everest Base Camp. That's about, about 5,500 meters, right? But that's the Nepal side Everest Base Camp, right? That's like Mid Valley, la, right? Everybody goes there, right? Yeah. The one you're going through is through to the bad one, which hopefully I'm going to go for, right? So, what, what happens there? Well, why is it different? You drive literally up to the base camp of uh, the dependent site. And uh, from uh, there, you see the mountains uh, not even at, uh, I would say, like, straight line distance, like, between 5 to 6 kilometers. So first, you see the Everest north face uh, in full view. In full view means the full profile of the mountain, the full peak. Whereas you, uh, at then uh, you're at 5,200, the base camp. Oh, she's not that high. Not that high. Yeah. And then uh, uh, the trekking uh, from the Everest base camp, uh, if you are a member of the uh, Mountaineering Association of China, uh, which you have to be to take on that permit, uh, it will take you only up to maybe about uh, three weeks you can ascend up to Everest. Whereas on the south side, uh, you take you total to and back and forth uh, 55 days. That's the Nepal side. Nepal side. Yeah. And then uh, at Namji Bazaar, where you kind of uh, stop, uh, people will be telling you, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's Everest, the full uh, profile of the entire Himalayan, and then which is Mount uh, Everest, oh, you know, the small little peak there on the left, you know, beside the, oh, that, that's Everest. That's how you see that's the That's about full. 17, 20 kilometers from Namchi, right? A lot more, yeah. Uh, yeah. more, yeah. You see the whole Himalayan mountain, that one. The North Face Base Camp, you see, this is Everest. In full view. It's Bordeaux. That's uh, it. Yeah. It's like, Metahorn, there's no mistake. There's no, uh, which one, uh, that one, that one, oh, this is Lord C. No, 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 this is the Everest, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Only one. Only one, yeah. full view. And then the magical part about the North Face is, this is purely unexplainable. If you are Buddhist, you will see the face of Kuan Yin. If you are Christian, you see the face of Jesus Christ. What if you are like me? I have no religion. Then what do I see? 
Was she a beautiful girl? <laughs> Go there and find out yourself. <laughs> uh, do, I then, see, do I see Scarlett Johansson there instead? Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, um, and then, uh, if you are there on, uh, if there's moonlight, lah, you can see the North Face uh, reflecting against you. Uh, even more beautiful. Against the amazing, black yeah, sky. Yeah. You know, it's it's a totally, uh, I would say, lah, on the south side, the Nepali side, uh, you can only see the Everest, uh, uh, on the south side, you see a gradual slope, and then, the, the mountain is there. It's a, not a very full view of the mountain, you know. You, you have to go up to as close as a Hillary step on the south side before you can see the, the mountain is full, nice profile. On the Tibetan side, at the base camp, is a nice profile already. Yeah. So how many nights there? Two nights, one yes. night, two nights. Two nights. Fantastic. Two nights. I think I'm all over that already. Yeah. I think no choice already. Yeah. Thomas. But now the only yeah. thing is that uh, <laughs> the Chinese government has uh, stopped allowing uh, vehicles, own vehicles to be driven to the base camp. You have to come to a nearby village uh, and then they will bring you up by electric vehicles mm. Mm. to... to uh, so your convey, no problem? No, we still have to use electric vehicles. Oh. to the base camp because they're not allowed for environment purposes. Uh. You know, if everybody drives there full of uh, carbon monoxide and diesel, uh, they are saying that you contaminate the, the air oh, around the, the base camp. Okay, yeah. well, that's, that's quite fair then. Yeah, that's quite fair. So how, 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 what's the distance between the village where you leave your car and, and the <sighs> base camp? About uh, four or five kilometers. Okay, not too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just transport all the gear over to the EVs, yeah. uh, is it? Yeah, that's all. Okay, okay. So, uh, but, uh, okay, the highlight is the uh, Everest base camp. And uh, before getting the Everest base camp, right, you have to pass through the Sikatsu. And the Sikatsu is a huge monastery. Monastery is a place where the so-called monks live. Lah. And then you pass through some, quite a few crane villages. And the other highlight is, uh, just before the base camp, uh, there's another monastery called Rongbuk. Uh, Rongbuk Si, Rongbuk Monastery, uh, which is considered one of the higher Buddhism monasteries. Uh. And... Uh, if you go in there, what happens is that you just sit in the temple and uh, I would say la, 9 out of 10 people la, or even I would say 95 out of 100 people la, would feel a sense of peace, la, inner peace. La. doesn't matter what religion you are, but you feel inner peace. La. Oh, the the environment, the ambience, you know. So, that's what Tibet is all about. Uh, the magic, the inner peace, the big landscapes, uh, the culture. Uh, and uh, Tibet is one place uh, where you go there once, uh, it probably won't be your, your last time. Uh. It has got this magnetic draw, you know. Okay, uh, this trip probably will be my 10th time there. La. Oh, no. Are you serious? You've yeah. been 10 times? Yeah. Okay. So, but uh, why why do I still want to go there? Yeah. But uh, every few years, I go back there just to see what's happening, you know, just to go and visit my friends and, and uh, like, uh, recharge our... our Inner peaceness. La. Our, our, our exploring uh, passion. La. So, so... Um, so if you're a civilian and you don't have any contacts there, how difficult is it to go to Tibet normally? First, you, of course, everybody needs to apply for a Chinese visa, which is, you know, can be done anyway here. Yeah. And then you need a, a, a ground contact, uh, usually it's a travel agent, mm. that will have to get you a Tibetan permit because it's an autonomous region. It's a self-rule uh, mm. province. Mm. And uh, getting a Chinese visa is not automatic entry into Tibet you still have to get a, uh, another perm a dependent permit before you can get in. Uh, because uh, the minute you land in anywhere, if you fly in, the first thing the hotel asks you is where's your... Mm. If, you don't your have paperwork a, if you don't have paperwork, they cannot even check you in. So, how, so, so when, when, you, when, when you plan your trips, right, 
what is the process? How do you... Of course, now it's a bit easier for you, lah, right? But normally, last time when you plan your trips, because right? the world is so huge, right? How do you plan the trip and how long does it normally take? Uh, each trip will take one year to plan. Uh, and most of the time, you have to go and recce. Recce means uh, uh, maybe, you know, 10 months or one year ahead uh, in the past, you have to fly in and go and see for yourself. Uh, of course, uh, nothing beats uh, nowhere in the world. Uh, you can read the entire internet world. Uh, you will not get the, the feel. Uh, uh, you, you have to go there to feel the, uh, the air, to uh, see the scenery, uh, to be inspired. Uh. And our trips uh, is about inspiring uh, fellow uh, explorers. Uh. If I I need to be inspired myself, then you can radiate the the passion, the interest uh, to your fellow Malaysians. Uh. And every day we have a briefing. And uh, if you do not have that, I would say, uh, magic inside you. Uh. You cannot read it out. And uh, that will not make a good trip. Uh. Um, like for example, yeah. a travel agent. Yeah. It has got no soul, you know. A travel agent travel has no soul. Yeah, because they're not there. They're not on the ground. Yeah, they're not on the ground. They're just selling products. That's yeah. It. yeah. They will fly you in and then some uh, local office staff from uh, travel agent will come along. Okay, you know, queue up here, queue up there. Okay, get land up in some place. Okay, pass you to the local agent. The local travel guide, uh, he's a guide, you know. He's just a guide. Uh. He has got no passion, you know. He doesn't care. Not very much. Lah. All he cares about is bring you to shopping centres and show you around, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't care. You know, right? So there's no passion, there's no feel. Whereas our trips, uh, we have to look after this interest, this passion and uh, create the excitement and radiate all this uh, uh, magic to them. So, okay. So can I talk about the price of your trips or should I not? Should I? No, okay, sure. so 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 they're, they're not cheap, right? So a month trip is usually around about fifteen thousand US dollars, right, or thereabouts, fifteen it, to eighteen, uh, right, yeah. 15, twenty lah, thereabouts, right. So that's as much as a hundred thousand ringgit, maybe slightly less. But what you get is multiple countries, experience of a lifetime, bucket list type trips, right? What kind of people come on your trips? As a general uh, cost, uh, if you go on this kind of. Uh, Exploration trips, right? The usual cost uh, is in the region of 250 to 300 US per day. Which means, translated to ringgit, uh, is about 1,000 ringgit a day to uh, about uh, 1,300 per day. That is, let's say for example, you are joining a uh, uh, one-month trip. So it's uh, just to, on high side, uh, 300 times uh, 30 is 9,000 dollars, 9,000 US dollars. Uh, that is what it will cost you. Uh, which means uh, you uh, trip will take care of all your food, your accommodation, your uh, fuel, everything. But if you want to choose to bring your own vehicle, then you have to pay the vehicle-related cost, which is the fuel, the preparation, the permits. and So, so if you bring your own car, you pay for your own fuel, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So then do you take care of your own like backup tanks as well? Yes. Okay. So, uh, but uh, driving your own vehicle... Uh, it's another experience, you it's know. It's different because it's your own car, right? Yeah. yeah. If you just join, uh, what we call there are two cars. Because first is the ground cost. The ground cost uh, is your uh, accommodation, your food, your sightseeing, and then your entries and blah blah blah. That is between two fifty to three hundred US dollars per day. But uh, this is for overland trips, lah. Whether it's any part of the world, is about the same, lah. But if you go on these specialized trips, uh, like for example the Antarctica. You are talking about a uh, one thousand uh, to thousand five US dollars per day, Whew, which means uh, let's say if you join a a, a twelve day uh, or fifteen day trip lah. Uh, oh, you mean outside tra travel agent uh, uh, Okay. Let's say if you join a uh, uh, actually our trips are uh, no travel agent does it mm. because uh, there is no spirit, there is no soul, there is no passion in it. You know you can pay uh, uh, fifty thousand dollars to go for South America sixteen day trip. But uh, they're not going to bring you there. You know, they fly you in, uh, pass you over to the local ground handler, and okay, thank you very much. Good luck to you. This is Iguazu Falls, and this is Machu Picchu, this and this, and that's it. Lah. Hmm. 
you know. And uh, thank you very much. Here's my tip. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so these kind of trips, uh, uh, let's say for example, the other extreme is if you go to uh, Antarctica, it will be about one thousand, a thousand, three US dollars per day, but on a cruise. Yeah. Our trips is uh, <coughs> overland, uh, two fifty to three hundred US dollars per day. So if it's a one month trip, it's nine thousand, ten thousand US dollars. If it's a one and a half month trips, is around uh, twelve to thirteen thousand US dollars. Hmm. And then uh, actually, uh, in the larger larger scheme of things, it doesn't seem to be that. It is a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. But it's not that huge when you consider the relative comparison, lah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Then how do you plan your trips? I mean, because you've seen the world so many times already, right? It becomes harder and harder for you to kind of like feel, you know, the, the you know, so, so, you know, so I know Africa is your thing next year, right? And then beyond that, how do you plan your trips? What, what, what is the, what is the selection process? It, uh, actually, <coughs> because we are not a travel agent, we are not commercial, you know. So uh, every trip we do, uh, uh, honestly, like, I mean, this might sound a bit selfish, like, its own self want to do one. My, or? it must personally interest me first. Mm, mm. If I have no interest in that area or that trip for that time, uh, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Like for example, I feel that there's an urge for me to return to Africa because last time we were in Africa was in 2017, which means seven years ago, and uh, we want to go to a few more smaller game parks up north of the Serengeti, and then we want to visit a few of those parks uh, in Botswana and in Namibia. And in Zambia, uh, we are this time we are going to the smaller game parks. The smaller game parks means uh, the animals are still there. You are not going to a safari zoo, you know. Uh, smaller game parks means uh, there are so many game parks in 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 Africa, and uh, everybody goes to go to Kenya and Tanzania, but hardly anybody goes to uh, okay. You either go to South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, but what about Namibia? Botswana, Zambia. Uh, what about uh, Angola? What about uh, the chimpanzee sanctuary by uh, this? Uh, what's her name? A woman, you know, uh, Jane Goddard. Yeah, Jane yeah, Goddard. Yeah. yeah, Jane Goddard. You know what about all those places? Yeah. So uh, the next exploration trip we are going to these kind of places, smaller game parks, uh, where we go uh, glamping. Glamping means we stay in a tent. In champagne the, one uh, inside. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> almost lah, almost. <laughs> huh? No, because some of these guys that come on a trip, I mean, you have to have a bit of money lah, right? Yeah. And you, there's a certain expectation. So the food quality also must have a certain standard, right? Yeah, yeah. And then it's not, it's not uh, anchor beer lah, it must be maybe, I don't know, whatever beer, mm-hmm. right? Right. Like for example, in the Grumeti uh, game park, uh, which is north of Serengeti, yeah, uh, uh, you're talking about staying in a tented accommodation uh, and it costs uh, approximately 250 to 350 US dollars per night. That's Include, not cheap, yeah. That's not cheap. So it's about, uh, I would say about 1,000 to 1,005 per night for two persons. So if you're going there for, like for example, uh, three nights there, uh, only on accommodation, don't talk about your transportation, don't talk about everything. You are talking about six, seven thousand ringgit already. Actually, if you go on your own, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The thing is that, uh, uh, in the past, up to about 10, 15 years ago, uh, we were very fortunate. At that time, the ringgit was like two point five to <laughs> the US dollar, la. But now it's gone to four point five, uh, to US dollar. It's it's not that the things have gone up a lot in the world. It's just that our currency has kind of a, like uh, you know mm. depreciated. It hasn't kind of, it has depreciated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, even uh, you join any other trips uh, to, let's say, for example, to Scandinavia, you know, to South America, it will still cost you about 1,000 ringgit a day, even on a regular travel agent trip. Mm. Don't talk about exploration trip where you drive your own land cruiser, where you're there yourself, you know. And you have uh, Nasi Lemak in the middle of the yeah, winter, right? Yeah. That's huge, okay, by the yeah. way. Because after, for me, my um, my kind of like time frame is within the first three or four days, I'm like, oh, gosh, there's only so much pasta I can eat. Yeah. Or oh, there's only so much, you know, whatever Western food I can. After that, I'm like, 
I need something spicy already. Yeah. You know? Like the recent trip, we came back from uh, uh, Paris. We were camping in the Shotran Desert in Iran, the central desert oh, in Iran. Oh, Iran is beautiful, man. Beautiful. And uh, the desert is just like the Sahara. It's full of sand, sand dunes everywhere. And that night, uh, we were having uh, soup kambing. Fantastic. Soup kambing, Malaysian style. Not, not, not uh, soup kambing, Iran style. Soup kambing, Malaysian style. Prepared by our chef. I mean, <laughs> hello. It's a big deal. You are in a desert, you know, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Oh, I, fantastic. I love it. So, so I, I talk about retirement, you know, I talk about investments, I talk about making money and all that, right? But all that is no point unless you, like, like what Yusuf said, like, it's not your money until you spend it. And I think a lot of people don't realize that, um, you know, there's one thing to make your money, but it's also, it's another thing to really know how to enjoy it, right? And to also call time in your career because what for you go and work until 80 years old, right? Then you, you die with 300 million in the bank, then then what? Then you're, you know, the people who are get left behind, then they just kind of pung the money, right? This is what it's meant to be, la, you know? You know, the people that come on the trip, right? What are the conversations that happen? What do you all talk about? And these are business owners, la, right? Um, quite wealthy people, right? These trips uh, is all about happiness. Yeah. Uh, when you reach, uh, you know, uh, almost retirement, when your kids have grown up, you know, uh, and uh, you have more or less uh, want to travel, which you haven't done for since you were a boy, you know, you have worked so hard, you have you have provided for your family, you have uh, you have brought up your kids, you know, and then you suddenly think, oh, I haven't been to Iran, you know, okay, hey, I want to go and see. Uh, I wonder how, how, how Argentina looks like, you know. If you've got that urge, uh, then you better go. Because, uh, like you say, like you so rightly pointed out, the money is not yours until you spend it. Yeah. Because uh, if you put it in the bank, uh, right, it's the bank's. It's not yours. No, but I mean, even in the corporate world, you've got guys in their 70s, late 60s, you know, still working so hard. Of course, I don't think it's money that drives them anymore. Like it's the status, it's the power, it's the chase, it's all that, right? But then, you're so wealthy. And then what are you going to do? How many more years do you have left? You sort of uh, likened it to your battery power on your phone, you know, right? And, and say it's 50 years old, like, your battery power is maybe 35% left. <laughs> only, you know? No, right? right? So, and then you know the last 10% goes down very fast, right? <laughs> so you got like 20% battery power. Bloody hell, you better go, man. Otherwise, uh, what's the point of being alive? You've yeah. got one life, right? Yeah, yeah. Make, it, make it count. Mr. Yong, uh, Mr. Yong uh, of uh, British India, he told me that he calls me Tango. Tango. He calls you Tango. Yeah, yeah, because my, that's my radio call sign. That's your call sign. Yeah. Uh. So he says, uh, Aman says, uh, his name is Aman, we call him. Man, uh, so why are you joining Strip? Hey, brother, I only uh, hopefully got one decade left, you know. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean, one decade? I got 10 years of my life, you know. I worked uh, five decades, uh, now I've got one decade left. Uh, you think you still want to work like a dog? Ah, yo, you know. So, That's the point, right? Yeah. That's what it's all and about. Then, uh, and then, uh, he, uh, Mr. Young uh, has joined me uh, about uh, on uh, maybe 20 times, uh, 20 trips. Holy uh. shit, 20 times. And he told me, I asked, I asked Man, actually, what, what was the reason he joined? Uh? I want to be happy, ma. <laughs> One answer only, happiness. Our trips are all happiness. Because you are driving in a nice scenery. You are with good company. You are relaxed. And uh, it's all about being happy and laughing, you know. So he says, uh, when I'm at home, uh, okay, now and then I laugh. Lah. I look, I watch TV, I laugh a bit. Lah. But <laughs> all this, uh, uh, when I'm on a trip, uh, I naturally laugh, you know. Because things are so funny, people are so funny, everybody is laughing, everybody is cracking jokes, everybody wants to be happy. So uh, it's a mental conditioning, you know. Mm. When you're on a trip, uh, you naturally want to be happy. Yeah. It's normal. Uh, <clears throat> when even uh, the a group of Malaysian uh, mud rim pit, uh, when they go on a, on a trip, uh, or they drive, they drive from uh, KL to example Ipoh, uh, they are very happy. Uh, you know why? You know, they may be speeding, you know, but it's happiness, you know. Why yeah. do you want to go on a trip? Yeah, they're on a trip, yeah. Uh, why do you want to go camping? You want to be happy. And this trip, uh, is a, this kind of trip uh, is a prolonged happiness trip. Every day you're laughing, you're eating well, you're seeing good scenery, you're in comp company. <clears throat> okay, la, and in the evening you have coffee, you have tea, and those guys who want to drink have a, have a whiskey, have a beer. It's, it's for happiness, you know. It's relaxed. So, uh, uh, okay, you can do it at home. 
but you are alone. Not the same. Not the same. Not the same. When you are your friends, when you are, when you're on an adventure, you're in a different environment, you're seeing different things, uh, you're happy. It's all about happiness. And then sometimes, uh, not all the trips, because I know the Tibet one, you're not having them, right? But then sometimes you also have motorcycles. And that to me is also interesting, because that's another kind of like twist in the tail, right? <laughs> Because you got Land Cruisers, it's what this really quite you know quite quite unusual, right? And then you got the 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 bike, motor, the motorbikes as well. Are, are they under you? Are they your fleet as well, or do people bring their own, or or what? How how does that work? Uh, the reason is that uh, since I was a kid, la, I, I I like motorcycles, you know, I like riding motorcycles, and it, it's a sense of freedom. Yeah, huge. It's yeah. it's it's uh, you have got a wind in your face. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. you are exposed. You know, you are close to nature. And uh, I was riding motorcycles since I was thirteen years old. But then, uh, you know, these days we are getting a bit uh, coming of age. You know, I'm sixty plus, so <laughs> I still want to ride. And uh, therefore, to inculcate the spirit of uh, riding motorcycles. Uh, uh, for the past uh, 20 years, la, my first motorcycle trip uh, long distance was Trans-Mongolia. Oh, that's uh, amazing. Yeah, 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 we yeah. went to Mongolia with uh, Africa Twins, you know, and then since then, every other year, la, we have uh, trips. And then, uh, after that, uh, I find it oh, kind of tiring. La. One year, oh, one do motorcycle trip and one year do four by drive, four trip. So, all the last, uh, since uh, 2005, la, I've been merging uh, the motorcycle trips uh, together with the 4x4 trips. And it started off uh, by our first 2005 uh, London Colombo trip. We had I think Yusuf went on that one, right? Yeah. Yeah, he, he told me about it. Yeah, before that, Yusuf went already. Mm. Before that, uh, uh, he went on a trip to China on his ZZR 1100. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> he still got it, actually. That thing is capable of 200 miles an hour, you know. That's my, And he did London care on that. <laughs> He's a nutter, man. He's a real nut. So, uh, so, uh, How we, do you take the ZZR across the desert? <laughs> <laughs> he suffered, lah. He suffered, lah. Yeah, because yeah. you're, you're, you're hunched over, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas all the other fellows were on uh, dual purpose, lah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were all on uh, Africa Twins, you know, on uh, Trans Alp, on Super Tenery, you know. And then the current generation is all the BMWs and all the, yeah, the big GSs, Trans Tigers, right? yeah. you know. But uh, the big GS, la, is uh, generally, la, uh, they can, the big GSs, the 1200, it's a very, very superb machine. I think they're too big though. But they're just huge. They're just too but, big. But uh, it is meant for, I would say, la, 99% on-road and maybe 1% off-road. Mm. I don't even say 5%. La. Of course, the GS people will claim, oh, I rode it off-road. I rode mm. it through the desert. Hello. The desert got Tamek Road. No? I put it as, as, like this. La. Every time I ride a, a, a GS, uh, I myself own a 1200. And I, and the, the comp, I mean the 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 group has got uh, uh, three GS uh, three ten. So so you have your own fleet of um, bikes as well. Yeah. So you bought the three tens. Those are quite nice. Yeah. yeah we yeah. for <coughs> the two thousand nineteen we bought seven units of the three ten the mm. three S three ten. That one was just launched. Those are made in India. Yeah. Yeah. And we rode it from Kuala Lumpur to Paris, through. China to Siberia to Mongolia. Yeah, they're, they're pretty good off road as well, right? Yeah, very very light, and uh, it was uh, very fortunate lah. We didn't bring those uh, twelve hundred uh, into Mongolia, because through Mongolia uh, the total off road uh, on grassland on on on, on earth uh, the total was around two thousand kilometers. I tell you, any Malaysian uh, who tells me that he wants to bring his GS twelve hundred to Mongolia, don't bother. <laughs> I don't need to be there lah. I say good luck to you. Because you get stuck very easily in the yeah. sand, right? Then you can flip yeah. easily, right? Yeah. You can drop your bike one time. Okay, you get your mm. friends to pick it up. But after you drop your bike for the six, seven, ten time, uh, I don't think you want to pick up your bike. You want to burn the bike already. Uh. Yeah. No, because the bike itself alone, fully petroled up, is about 250 kg. 300, 300 kg. 370 kg, the GS12. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is wet weight. Like, without... Without your your bags as yet, is it? Yeah, without your pioneers and without this three hundred and sixty kilo just twelve. That's crazy. How can you pick it? You can't even pick it up. If you you're cannot alone. pick it up. Forget it. Forget it. Forget you can it. you can see you can watch a nice uh, video tape. Okay, this is how you pick up your bike uh, from the back. You know you ah, pick up like ah, hello. Yeah. That's on tarmac, okay. Ah. That's on hard ground. 
when you're on soft ground, oh, hi, yo. and you got your leathers on, and you're tired, and it's raining or it's snowing, forget it, man. You're already lambe already, ah. You want to pick up 360 kilograms. Ah. That's without your bags as well. Yeah. If you're fully laden, that's maybe yeah. 500 kg, yeah. right? Yeah. But then they show you how to pick up the GS12 uh, on tarmac, you know. All right. Hello. In the first place, uh, on tarmac, uh, when you, the reason you fall is Jato Bodo, like you call it. Mm. You know, on traffic light, you just fall like that. <laughs> you can pick it up. <laughs> but uh, the GS12, uh, you know, don't come and bullshit me. La, you know, it's impossible to write. La. Okay, they say, oh, look at the GS trophy. They can use a GS1200 uh, to go off-road. Uh, yeah, I know. But to go off-road uh, for 200 kilometers, you got to be so fit, so yeah. strong. I just came back uh, from India with a friend, Ramesh. Uh, yeah. Ramesh. Uh, yeah. He represented India in the Jazz Trophy. Lor. But the way he handled uh, the Jazz 12 uh, off-road, uh, he's an instructor. Lor. He said, Thomas, honestly, lor, the Jazz 12 uh, can go off-road, but not ask me to ride 200 kilometers off-road. I would die. Lor. You ask me to ride 5, 10, 20 kilometers, boleh. Lor. You ask me to ride through the desert, compacted ground, lor. boleh. Lor. But on, on dry sand, uh, uh, you know, the, the soft sand, right? It's hard. Yeah. When you see a lot of photographs, a lot of pictures, a lot of video, <coughs> gang ho riders uh, on nice big off-road machines, uh, wow, 800, uh, 1000, and then see the Paris Dakar guy tearing down the KTM 450 and all. Uh, those are experts, professionals, but not you and me that go to work every day. Yeah. <laughs> and sunny, then... sunny, sunny, you're not a GS12. Uh? Sorry, la, no, such yeah, no such thing. You know, there was one, a couple of years ago, I interviewed a guy called BK Lim. I don't know whether you know him or not. He passed away, I think, last year. Super good guy. He's a he's a major rider. La. Have you heard of him? Yes. Huh. He famously did the Penang, uh, Downing Street, Penang to Downing Street, yeah. London, right? I think 13 or 12 of them, right? Youngest guy was only 65 years old. Oldest guy was only 70 years old, whatever, right? Cup Chai. They went on Cup Chai's. The most reliable, the lightest, the most um, easy to repair. I think two, only I think at the end, only about four or five of them actually got to London, right, and went to take pictures in front of the Ten Downing Street. I think one died in New Delhi. Uh, he told me about it. Fantastic! I went and interviewed him in Samsun in Penang. I, I'm so glad I got the story because you know he's gone now. I was actually going to join him on his uh, South America trip. He was going to go from he was going to start at Patagonia and go up. He was going to go there by a container ship, save money. He's one of those guys, uh, uh, fantastic guy, lovely. But his philosophy was that the cheapest bike, the most reliable bike, is the EX5, <laughs> right? A lot of people don't realize, forget the BM GS 1200, it's too big, it's too unwieldy. Forget yeah. it. Yeah. You drop the bike, you cannot pick up anymore. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. You know the guy, right? Yeah, Big Lim. Yeah, legend. He's yeah. a legend. Yeah, legend. Lim Bokya. Yeah, yeah. Bakya. Yeah, Bokya. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, on biking, is a, a different ballgame altogether. So far, the only, uh, one of the few guys uh, I know uh, that can handle a GS12 or GS11 is my, I would call him my riding partner. Uh, is a guy called Mama Ase, uh, aka known as One Dollar. One Dollar. Yeah, One Dollar. He, I don't even dare to ask why his name is one dollar. <laughs> he used to bring uh, the BMW Motorrad Club two times uh, to uh, uh, Mecca, Jeddah. And, That's a good trip as well. Yeah, yeah. and then two times. He has ridden uh, all over South America on his GS11. He has ridden uh, from uh, Digan, driven, driven to uh, Garmisch. Uh, in of uh, BMW motorrad days and after it goes straight up to uh, Scandinavia and all those places he's written in China he's written all over the place la. so and uh, I would say la, he's one of the best uh, off-road riders la. and uh, when we went to South America uh, we crossed the Chaco Desert la. the Chaco Desert la, is a sand desert la, spanning over around 300 kilometers la. He was carrying uh, his at that time his girlfriend, of course, oh, yo. now his wife oh, Two up some more. Yeah, on oh. a on a GS11, riding over three hundred kilometers off road on sand. No, he must be one of the best riders I've ever seen. It's so hard. It's yeah. so hard, yeah. and 
you got to keep the right speed, you know, keep the yeah. right gear. and It's very simple. <coughs> uh, you go slow, it goes, because of the corrugation, uh, yeah. it's bumps, bump, bumpy like hell. You go fast, you reduce the bumps. But the faster you go, the harder you fall. Mm. Same logic. Mm. Uh. Mm. And uh, that trip, uh, I have ridden motorcycles for 30 years. Uh. Maybe in total, uh, I've dropped less than 10 times. Uh. But in that trip, in one trip alone, uh, I dropped more than 10 times. Until, until his girlfriend that time, uh, every day was scolding me. You get up, you motherfucker. <laughs> you know, whatever. <coughs> you are a man, you get up, you know, you don't give up, you know. I said, I'm going to burn this machine. Uh. <coughs> you are just like pissed already. Like. Yeah, you know. So, but the recent trip, we, we rode, uh, I rode partially, and the guys that rode full from uh, Paris back to Calcutta was uh, $1, Afandi, and then Nuru, Nuru Nadra. So I went to your lunch at Publica that day. Yeah. There was one or two girls who actually did the whole trip by bike, right? One, one, one girl. Uh, one girl, right? Yeah. Uh, this Nuru girl. Like, Nuru right? Nadra. So it's not impossible for actually girls to ride also, right? No. Yeah. Nuru is, a, to me now, is a special woman. In 2009, she was only the pillion. She didn't even know how to ride a motorbike, motorbike you know. I've seen her. She's not that big. She's not that, you know, she's, she's actually like normal size. Yeah. Nuru Nadra. Uh, so she rode a 310 BM. La. In 2019, she was only a pillion mm. for part of the trip, you know. She was pillion to $1. Uh, she was pillion from uh, Europe down to Paris. Don't know, right? But, you know, came back to Malaysia after that, went to most fun gym, Okabing. Oh, Okabing. Uh, uh, uh. Learn how to ride machine, ride he's bike. A good, he's a good teacher. Yeah. Mm. And then went to a few other places to learn uh, riding. And then 2023, rode all the way from Paris to Calcutta. What about Anita Yusuf? Have you spoken to her before? Anita Yusuf? She's actually quite special also. Yeah, right? yes. I tried to get in touch with her on Facebook. She's, I think, teacher or something. She was invigilating an exam. She said, but she's quite media shy, right? And unlike most of these kind of people, right? She's very media shy. Doesn't speak English so well, so we communicate in BM, right? But to me, she's quite special as well. Right? I know you so when you when, when she comes back here, she, she'll be back. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I want to put her on the podcast as well. She won't be back here so soon, lah. She's in Iceland now, right? No, she left Iceland. Iceland right now. She's in uh, US. Mm, she's riding across US now. Ah, yeah. Last, last we heard that she was in Vegas. And she's always solo, right? Ah, yeah. always solo. Yeah. But, uh, so, uh, for biking, uh, well, for me, because I prefer to ride in groups of, small groups, uh, support up to la. seven bikes. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, like, uh, with support, and that's when you enjoy your ride. Uh. You don't have to worry about your bio bikes, you don't have to worry about accommodation, you don't have to worry about your clothes, your food and everything. That's when you enjoy your ride. Because you've got support, right? Yeah. yeah you've yeah. got parts and everything as well. Yeah. yeah. But this time, uh, the Paris to KL, uh, $1 and Afendi. Afendi Road is uh, GS12, GS812, and then $1 Road is GS12. I've got the... one burning question, which you may not or may or may not want to answer, right? Why is he named $1? Uh... A long time ago, la, you know, we used to <laughs> go and uh, all this do all this kind of uh, clearance and also so forth, la. And uh, okay, la, uh, when you do clearance, you know, you have to. You mean that border crossings, la, Yeah, is it? Uh. you have to do a lot of uh, you know greasing, la, so called. Oh, so one dollar, la. <laughs> <laughs> That's, a, that's quite affordable, uh, $1, at least not $100, right? Greasing means uh, the person who even uh, takes your passport, the person who passed your document to... Uh, every transaction. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. the person who does small, small things for you. So he will carry a lot of $1 notes. Uh, one US dollar. <laughs> no. Brilliant. Not the 10... <laughs> maybe he will have 100 pieces of $100. So, so you know, at the end, he's, you know, like uh, almost... Santa, Santa Claus, Claus la, la, Santa you know. Claus, la, ha. henceforth one dollar yeah, la. Yeah, <laughs> that is so cool, man. That is so cool. That's so cool. So when are you gonna do an, another? It's so does the Africa next year? Does the Africa trip next year comprise motorcycles as well? Uh, if people want to go, I'll bring. Yeah, because uh, our in our fleet we have got uh, six, seven motorcycles. Yeah, all three tens, ah. 
three tens and twelve hundreds, and then uh, we have got one eight hundred, uh, and then uh, we actually we are thinking of uh, doing the next trip uh, from London to Cape Town. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, so this twenty twenty five lah, is it? No, twenty four. Oh, because you got Africa in twenty four, right? Yeah. So you do you do two next year? No, we will we will do four by fours and bikes together lah. Okay. Okay. London, Singapore, London, Cape Town, uh, through the West African coast lah. Okay, that's that means, unusual because everybody takes the eastern side. Yeah, that yeah. means uh, you go down uh, to usual. Uh, France and Spain, you know. You come in through, through Morocco, lah. Uh, right? Come into and then uh, sail across the Algiers, the ferry to Tangiers, and then go into uh, Morocco, Western Sahara, and then go along the western coast, lah. Western coast of uh, all these uh, Ivory Coast, Iberia, Ghana. Just go along the coast, lah. Don't go inland. Mm. Inland, you're in trouble. Mm. Go along the, the coast, down to Ghana, Ivory Coast, Liberia, Nigeria. Don't go inland because mm. you hit the Boko Haram. Yeah. Uh, along the coast and then go into uh, all this and then go along the coast hit come down to uh, uh, Congo and Kinshasa and then uh, into Angola and then into Namibia into Angola? Safe? No? Yeah, safe. Safe, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Luanda is safe. Angola is safe now. No more fighting because uh, now uh, the country is one of the most progressive countries and uh, as usual uh, China has built a massive port there mm. in Luanda port and then uh, come down Angola and go into Namibia and then end up in Cape Town. So, Chop, so you got Africa in when? Uh, um, your, what, what, what is that? June, July, is it? Africa, uh, the first part of the Africa will be hot. That's when in Europe, uh, you have to go sometime uh, in August, September. The reason is that uh, on the Northern Hemisphere, uh, summertime is very hot. When North Africa is very hot yeah. because you're on the Northern Hemisphere. But, uh, the southern hemisphere. Once you cross uh, Uganda, the line of uh, Uganda, the equator line is uh, the the reverse, you know. So uh, we are thinking of going in uh, autumn next year. So it's not so hot in Europe and uh, North Africa, and then uh, when we hit into uh, southern part of Africa, it's not too cold. Because uh, in uh, you'll be surprised uh, that you, when, for example, after Uganda, you go beyond south of Angola. Uh, it's the river, southern hemisphere, you know. So southern hemisphere means uh, year end uh, is summer. Mm. Like and in Australia like that? Yeah. Like? Oh. So you have to go during autumn which is not too hot in Europe and, and not, not too, too cold yeah, not in cold the south. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the Africa trip yeah. uh, in August, September. Yeah. So London, Cape Town is when? That, that trip, uh, that time. Uh. Oh, so you'll be merged into one big trip. Uh. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So you'll be passing to Dhaka, you know, Senegal, and those places. La. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But the... Uh, uh, Paris, Dhaka, Dhaka, as in Paris, Dhaka, the, the race, right? Yeah. Yeah. But now the event is no more in Paris, in Africa anymore. Now the event is in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that's right. So uh, uh, the reason why a long time ago they took the event off Africa was because of the uh, security concerns la, mm, mm. in Western Sahara, in Mauritania, you know, so they took it off to... Uh, South America, but now Saudi Arabia has paid big money to bring the event there. So oh, everything is going to the Middle East now, man. Yeah. The footballers are going there. The golf is going there. F one. F one is gone yeah. there. Wow, that's the new center of the universe, really, lah. Money, uh. Money. Mm. Governments pay big money to it. Yeah. Good lah, good lah. So then they, they uh, less less commercial lah, and you know, mm. in the other parts of the world. Yeah. Like for example, uh. uh Recently, the, we were in Dubai. Uh, mm. The new Emirates Stadium, the new airport. Yeah. My God, it's a huge, nice airport. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done trips through the Middle East? Uh, no. Not really, right? Because yeah. it can be quite troublesome, right? That yeah. part of the world. Because the Middle East, uh, there are only two ways to go in the Middle East. Uh, one is through Pakistan, and the other way is from the north. From the north, uh, you have to cross through Jordan and those places. Uh. So it's how beautiful Jordan is gorgeous. Yeah, so uh, uh, right now uh, I foresee uh, that uh, in the very near future uh, we have to go and do one there. But I will not enter uh, Middle East uh, from uh, the north. We will enter Middle East uh, from Iran. Yeah, 
you run. That means uh, you either start from uh, Karachi and cross the Taftan border into Iran and then go into Bandar Abbas uh, and ship across uh, to Emirate, you know, UAE. And then UAE uh, go into Saudi and go into uh, uh, Oman, not into Yemen. Mm. Yemen is trouble yeah. still, right? Yemen yeah. is still at war. Yeah. So Oman is a beautiful place. Saudi, part of Saudi, and then the UAE. La. UAE, uh, that's all. Wow, okay, amazing, amazing. Yeah, I'm uh, not surprised there's a huge demand, even though you don't do any marketing for your trips. Mm-hmm. It kind of like sells itself, la, and people will talk about it, right? Yeah. I think till today, Yusuf still uses his pictures on his Facebook. I just saw one, you know, some of his Africa pictures are really, really good, right? Yeah. He's still using them. Yeah. Yeah, Yusuf is is a legend, lah. You know, yeah. he just did a cancer research. Uh, yeah, that's right. Option, With yeah. Ingte, right, the artist. Yeah, Ingte yeah. is to join us too. Yeah. Mm. Oh, so you get a lot of these like um, interesting people on your trip, huh? Yes, Ingte joined us for yeah the African trip. I was uh, where was I? I was in um, I was in Bangsa Shopping Centre. You know, on top of Bangsa BSE, right? All the furniture shops there. But it's not just your normal, you know, um, furniture shop. La. One so far can cost you 80,000 won, you know. <laughs> that kind of place, right? So I saw this quite for me. Because, because Yusuf posted, you know, his friendship with Ingte, right? And then, oh, you know, go and buy buy Ingte before it comes to Latif Mohidin prices and all that, right? No, you can still buy an Ingte for, for double-digit thousands. Okay, fine. So, quite distinctive, his, his art, right? So I saw one piece above the one of these $70,000 so far, right? <laughs> oh, that, that looks familiar. Is that Ingte? Yes, Ingte. Oh, how much is it? 295000 <laughs> So it's not cheap, man. Yeah. But you need, you get successful people on your trip star, right? Uh, successful, yes. You, you, you must have the time. La. A lot yeah. of successful people have no time. Cash rich, time poor. Uh, don't have to be cash rich. If you you can also opt to eventually come and uh, join the trips as a part crew, eventually lead to a full crew. Uh, so full crew don't need to pay one uh. You full just crew, work la. You pay for your etiquette, mm. and then you pay a uh, minimal la, mm. ground mm. cost la. Mm. Mm. ground cost means uh, what we pay to third party, you know. Mm. Like that, third party. That means, uh, uh, third party means you pay for a little bit of subsidized uh, food and subsidized uh, accommodation and all. Uh, and then you have to be able to drive, you have to be able to multitask. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, all of us can learn, have to learn how to cook. All of us have to learn how to do mechanical repairs, basic repairs, chain engine oil, how to repair tires. All of us must learn to do that. Mm. All of us must learn how to do a little bit of wiring, electrical, full crew. Uh, uh, all of us must learn radio, uh, must learn uh, to have a superb good PR, must be able to tell jokes. <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of jokes. Yeah. Blue, white, green, purple, everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our trips, uh, everybody, uh, during the final briefing, I, I tell them that you must come up with, you must have two jokes in your hand because uh, you might be called any time to tell a joke. You must learn how to sing a song. You must be able to sing a song. <laughs> It would be advantageous if you play some musical instrument. Ah, you know, ah. if you cannot play swimming instrument, at least you know play a uh, cymbal or, <laughs> or you know. How's or, your How's your musical skills, bro? And then all the crew must be must must be able to dance, ah. <laughs> entertain lah. <laughs> yeah, because it's um it's a trip, right? Yeah. You have to have fun, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know the crew has to be like that. Okay, man, this is an amazing conf- yeah. conversation lah. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, looking forward, <laughs> shall we say, I'm looking forward <laughs> to the journey with you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, man. Thank Thanks you. Yeah. Thank care. you, cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, brother.